Welcome to uh, our workshop. Uh, on behalf of myself and Miranda Bradley, who's my co-chair, uh, welcome. Uh, we have nothing to, to disclose related to this presentation. And uh, our objectives today are to describe the impact of respiratory education on pediatric and adult transition programs and quality improvement efforts, and to identify the benefits and barriers to a, a structured approach for RT education and CF care. Um, these education is related to airway clearance therapies and home spirometry. We are going to discuss the methods and processes for implementing standardized airway clearance protocols and identify ways to increase the number of patient visits with respiratory therapists and uh, describe ways that the RTs can support our CF patients in uh, transition from pediatric to adult care. We're going to review and use methods, uh, review uh, methods for incorporating home spirometry as a monitoring tool in people with CF. Um, select approach uh, for RT education uh, and patient self-care and compare outcomes when access to RTs and CF clinic is reduced. Uh, we're going to have five abstracts uh, of 15 minutes each with Q&A after. And uh, one thing I would definitely like to uh, highlight is all the respiratory education, the quality improvement efforts that our presenters are going to speak on today. It takes a great deal of time and effort to do those projects. So. Um, I don't feel like 15 minutes is enough to highlight the amount of work that our presenters have done for all this today. Uh, our first speaker today is Dr. Ryan Thomas. He is the Division Chief of Pediatric Pulmonology and the Director of the Michigan State University Cystic Fibrosis Center. He's also the Director of Scholarly Activity at Sparrow Hospital Michigan State University Pediatric Residency Program and an Assistant Professor of Pediatrics at hum of Human Development at Michigan State University College of Human Medicine. Welcome, Ryan. I'd like to thank you guys for having me here today. Everyone can hear me okay? Awesome. That's usually not a problem for me, but... All right, uh, there's the disclaimer. And I, uh, I have done some advisory work for Vertex, but um, I think you'll, you'll see, I don't think this has any impact on the project at all, but felt like I should at least include it. So talking about airway clearance therapies, I'm in an RT session, so the slide's probably pretty unnecessary, but we'll be talking about sort of these three, um, you know, mechanical uh, airway clearance, whether the, uh, percussion or the vest or some other device, uh, Dornace Alpha, uh, used to decrease exacerbations, improve lung function, slow uh, rate of lung function decline, hypertonic saline, uh, high osmolarity, draws water in the mucus, improves mucus clearance, and decreases exacerbations. And so obviously these have played a really important role in the management of CF for a long time. Um, and so when we look at the guidelines, you know, airway clearance therapies are recommended in all patients in CF. For infants with CF under the age of two, um, they can use Dornase Alpha or hypertonic saline if they're symptomatic. Uh, hypertonic saline Dornase Alpha should be started by age of four for um, all children. And I think anyone who's worked in CF, you can see these, these guidelines were from 2009, 2016. And how we manage and implement and initiate airway clearance therapies seems to be very different from center to center. And, um, and so what we did is I was sort of questioning, and it came from the CF conference. Is this still the best approach? I, talking to colleagues, center directors, everyone seems to do something a little bit different. And this all started in 2019 at the CF conference. Um, I saw an abstract, and subsequently a, a pa there or it was a talk that included this paper, and it showed that infection is not required to cause inflammation in animals with CF. Bears treated with antibiotics from birth have less infection, but they still develop bronchiectasis, inflammation, and mucus accumulation. And um, they use proteomics to demonstrate a mucoinflammatory signature in the CF lung. And they saw a lot of uh, muc 5 b and neutrophil chemotractants. We know neutrophils play a big role in the damage that happens in the CF airways. And then, you know, there's this subsequent paper, um, airway mucus accumulation was correlated with inflammation in children. They did lavage studies of 46 preschool children. Airway mucins were elevated in CF versus non-CF bowel fluid, regardless of whether there was infection or not. And the mucins mucus place correlated with inflammation, uh, airway hypoxia, and oxidative stress within the airways. And that really indicates that early CF lung disease is characterized by increased mucus burden and inflammatory markers without infection or structural lung disease. 
And then, last but not least, there was this study looking at the early initiation of hypertonic saline in infants with CF. Um, 42 infants, less than four months old, were randomized to hypertonic saline or normal saline inhalation, and the lung clearance index was man uh, measured at 52 weeks, um, and it was substantially larger in the children treated with the hypertonic saline. Uh, weight gain was improved in the infants treated with this hypertonic saline, and um, there, was a subsequent, there was another paper, an older paper, that looked at the initiation of hypertonic saline in older infants, and it did not reverse the lung disease that had already been there. So it, cumulatively, what I took from this is mucus plugging and inflammation is present early in the airways in people with CF. If we start hypertonic saline early in infancy, we can preserve lung clearance index, but if we start it later in infancy, we may not be able to recover what was lost. And so we came back to our center and said, well, well let's see what we're doing. And we looked at um, our registry data, and this is from the age two to five, and that's the way the registry publishes it, and since that's the easiest way to access it, that's the way we looked at it. And we found that 64% of our patients at our center were on hypertonic saline, and 57% um, were on uh, Dornase Alpha. Thankfully, everyone over the age of four was on it, but it's not really the way we looked at the data. So, um, so then we just said, well, what are we going to do about it? And we sat down as a group, and with the help of our respiratory therapy colleagues, um, we came up with a protocol. And basically, at our pre-clinic huddle, we would review the therapies for each child at each visit, and we would make a recommendation to start our therapy based on age and health. The therapies could be started earlier than planned in the setting of an exacerbation or respiratory symptoms. Outcomes were registered, registered using the uh, registry, and um, again, they track the group as age two to five, so that's the one we use, and uh, N minus one, two proportion test to look at statistical significance. And this is what it is, it's a flow chart. Um, it's nothing fancy. Uh, you know, we just, at the first month visit, we'll start the manual airway clearance, albuterol. If they become symptomatic, we'll start the hypertonic saline early. If not, the goal is to start it by three months of age. And then again, same thing with the Dornase Alpha. The goal is to have it started by four to six months of age, but we'll start it earlier if, if child's symptomatic or, or needs something more. And initiating of this protocol made big changes. Um, we went from 64% to 100% on hypertonic saline, and I'll say this is prescription. You know, we were not measuring how often they were using it, and that's obviously having the medicine is the first step in, in being able to use it, but that doesn't mean that they are. And post-protocol uh, Dornase Alpha was up to 90%, and the, the one patient who didn't uh, use it, it was, we'll call it uh, politely parental indifference. They had the option of having it, they just, they just never, they never, never wanted it. So. We're at conclusion, we successfully implemented a protocol to increase the initiation of airway clearance therapies within our institution. You know, our hope was that this would decrease mucus plugging and inflammation in infants and improve their long-term lung function. And the one thing I didn't mention was that we started this protocol March 1st of 2020. And a lot happened after that. And so we went back and looked at the data three years later, you know, where hope was we'd see less antibiotic use or better lung function in older kids, or we'd be able to track this a little bit more details, um, but both the pandemic and modular therapy, and that's why I say, if anything, Vertex hurt me on this one. Um, it was really complicated our ability to assess more, but you know, I, th I think we're proud of what we did in increasing the rates of these uh, use in our clinic. So and that's uh, it. I'd like to thank uh, Wendy Bauck, she's our respiratory therapist who really took the lead on this. Um, you know, I, have, I think my, my role was really to give her the confidence that I had her back. If she said we need to start this kid on something, that I would have her back and support her with the other clinicians in our, in our center. And I'd like to thank the rest of the CF team, they're, you know, as with, uh, they're awesome, as, as all of you are, and it's such a pleasure to work with them and as part of the CF community. I didn't question you after, and um, we'll do some questions now. Mm -hmm. and then we'll do questions at the end. So you can put uh, questions through the app or come to the microphone. Um, my, my first question initially is, are you planning to use the same uh, procedures for prescribing like hypertonic saline in the uh, age of modulators? Yeah, you know, we, we have not changed anything in the age of modulators. Um, I, I think obviously early data from the Simplify study suggests that maybe we don't need to be as aggressive as we used to be, but we're talking about a population that isn't on or eligible for modulator, a great number of these kids. 
And then, you know, all the data we have on this is short term. I thought there was a really interesting presentation yesterday from the group who did the Promise study that showed that unlike the Vertex data, post-modulator, we are not seeing a change in the rate of lung, uh, lung function decline in the real world population. And one of their hypotheses for that is the, vert the, the, you know, the modulators are doing a great job of um, improving CFTR function and improving um, everything else in CF, but as we're backing away from some of these airway clearance therapies, we not, may not be maximizing the benefit we're getting from that, because there, the Vertex studies all showed people were still using their airway clearance and that rate of lung function decline was much better, but the promised data yesterday really does not suggest that we're seeing that rate of lung function decline drop in a real world population, and if everyone stopping their airway clearance is contributing to that, we're missing a, you know, we're missing a, an opportunity to preserve long-term lung function. And I think there's other studies coming we should know more in the next year or two. So I'm not in a hurry to get rid of the airway clearance therapies. Uh, I think I, I may be on the very cautious end of the spectrum here, but um, I, I think a little bit of patience may do our patients some service. Great, thank you. We have a, um, at, two, at least two questions here from the app. The first one is, um, did you start infants at three months with seven or three percent? We find our infants tolerate seven percent at six months, so we start palmasime at three months instead. You know, I, sh I should have mentioned this. We started everyone on seven percent to start, and we didn't have anyone who had to get, discontinuate discontinue, discontinue <laughs> hypertonic saline, though we did have three patients who had to switch from the 7% to the 3% in order to tolerate it. So, um, you know, the goal is we aim high, and if they don't tolerate it, we always counsel the families. Like, you may see a lot of coughing or wheezing or something afterwards. Make sure you pre-treat with albuterol, and if it's problematic, we're happy to switch, you know. And then another question from the app. Are you always using albuterol in these ages, regardless of wheeze or cough? You know, we are, and I will say that was the way I was trained, and then when I joined MSU, that was the way they did it at that center. Yeah, I'm not going to um, argue that there is awesome data behind that practice, but I also didn't feel compelled that it's harmful in any meaningful way, that, it, that I thought I should stop it. We do see a lot of airway reactivity in both younger and older children with CF, and it can come and go throughout their lifetime. And so even if they're not having it at the time you're starting these therapies, it doesn't mean they won't develop it as they get older. So from my standpoint, we, we continue to use it. Great, thank you for that. Um, one more on the app. What challenges might arise in tracking the long-term effectiveness of airway clearance therapy and reducing mucus plugging and inflammation given the influence of, oh, well, you kind of already answered this, the highly effective <laughs> modulator therapies on disease program. I think you kind of already addressed that. So. That's good. Somebody was thinking ahead. That's yeah, and I just want to say that I love that you sort of committed to supporting your respiratory therapist with the protocol because I think, um, like without that physician support, I think it gets really hard. And can you speak to, did you have any, um, did you have to overcome any like parental objections to sort of implementing the protocol? You know, I, I don't think so. Um, you know, for the most part, we're talking about pretty new babies with families that are still pretty freaked out about everything. And, you know, I would just sit down and explain this is the benefit of it. And um, this is why we're doing it. And I, I try to, as much as possible, talk about the reasons that I gave here for doing it, maybe in a, a little bit uh, more layman's terms. But, you know, we think this is important. And the nice thing now is, you know, our, our hope is that this is a temporary treatment plan, right? If the modulators work as well as we all hope they do, you know, that we're talking about intensive airway clearance therapy for just a few years and then maybe we can back off. As you, I have some, I'm a little skeptical of that as, as you heard earlier, but, you know, I think um, talking families into something like, you know, our hope is that this is not a forever thing, makes it a little bit easier to do it. We're trying to make the lungs as normal as possible when we start those modulators so that uh, lung function can be as good as possible long term. Thank you so much. Anyone else? Uh, our next speaker is uh, Catherine Hobart, and uh, she's a pharmacist, and I would just like to say that uh, I cannot believe that it's just recommended that we have pharmacists on the CF team, not a requirement, because our pharmacists uh, at Riley, where I work, are I think the, probably the hardest working members of our team, they're, they basically, if I have a question about RT stuff, it's always like, where's the pharmacist at? Um, 
Yeah. <laughs> uh, Catherine earned her doctorate of pharmacy from Duquesne University in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Uh, after graduation, she pursued, pursued two years of postgraduate residency at Rainbow Babies and Children's Hospital, as well as the University of Arizona. Uh, currently, Dr. Hobart serves the Pediatric and Adult CF Center at Banner University Medical Center in Tucson, which I'm imagining is a great deal of work. Welcome, Katie. <laughs> Thank you for the introduction. Um, thank you all for being here this morning. And so today I'm going to talk about one of our quality improvement initiatives, uh, growing pains and transitioning patients from pediatric to adult care. I have nothing to disclose. And today we're gonna talk about the importance of medical transitions, how to develop critical strategies for patients to gain the skills necessary to be an independent adult and to assume care and also integrate lifelong and collaborative transitions among team members to optimize patient health outcomes. So transitions of care are really tr uh, transitioning to becoming a focus in the medical field. And so um, this is a max multifactorial transition. And as you can see in the diagram there, that there are several components of care. There is the illness transition and talking about what that illness trajectory is going to look like, how to cope with some of the complications and challenges that one may face with that disease state. And then there's also the developmental transition. So as we see children age and grow, they should be meeting developmental milestones, talking about some of those lifelong transitions in terms of education and career paths, um, future planning, relationships, and independence. And so for the purpose of this uh, quality improvement initiative, we're talking mostly about future planning and independence and trying to facilitate that, that exchange from parents to children to assume responsibilities. And so you can see here, there's a suggested list of six critical steps in order to form a successful transition for children in that the medical team, in particular pediatricians and in our case, our CF care center teams really help kind of foster that relationship, gain that trust, and have that um, rapport with patients and families to be able to have a smooth handoff. So within our uh, community, CF is really changing. And as you've all heard over the last several days and years, that highly effective modulators have really changed the landscape of what transition is going to look like for patients that have CF. And so now the median age is up to 61 years. And with this diagram, you can see that our percentage of pediatric population versus adult population is that this is shifting from a pediatric disease state to an adult disease state. And so now we need to start thinking about the long-term implications and aging of our, of our patients. Unfortunately, the lifespan for those who are ineligible for modulators are still lower than those um, eligible, but that's something that we're continuing to work on and grow. So within our CF clinic, we established the goal by January of 2027. Our goal is to have 80% of our children with CF uh, that will be able to independently manage their own medications by the time that they're 18 years of age. And this really stemmed from seeing some of our patients transition out of the adult, our pediatric clinic to adult clinic. And when we asked a patient, you know, how do you expect to get your medicines while you're away at college? And they said, oh, my mom's gonna drive them to me. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, but you're going to college five hours away. And they're like, yeah, they're gonna come visit. I'm like, we're gonna work on this. Um, so really what our plans for transitioning of care is for these patients to be able to articulate what their treatment program is, identify their medications and why they're taking them, how to acquire them, which I think is one of the biggest challenges, and how to interact with the healthcare team independently. Because for those of you in pediatric clinics, you may ask a child a question and you hear this voice from across the room that shoots out the answer and you're like, where did that come from? And it's the parents in the background. So what we've done is we've done several PDSA cycles to try different things and see what works and what doesn't work. And we're gonna go through each of these steps in a little bit more detail. 
And so the first thing that we did was introduce the idea of transitioning, um, ex having children being able to explain what CF is because knowledge is power. And so when they're able to explain their disease state to others, they can show a better understanding and that does develop over time. So having a maybe five-year-old explain to you what CF is compared to a 25-year-old, it will be a different understanding. Um, we'll talk about the medication lists. Having the patient understand and know their order of medication is really important in order to optimize their airway clearances, how to administer their different medications, having them organize medication and store them appropriately. So making sure that their Dornase Alpha is in the refrigerator, inhaled Tobermyosin is in the refrigerator, where to find these things within their home is really important. Having them, uh, we'll talk about our independent visit strategies and then ultimately send them to our adult clinic. So one of the things that we've developed in each clinic, we have a tracking device. And so all of the patients, regardless of age, are slated onto our tracking device. And you can see here what the different measures and metrics are that we're trying to touch upon, which serves as a really good facilitator and reminder for us as a clinical team to be able to start and facilitate these discussions. So even in our younger population, we're starting to introduce the idea of transitioning and saying it, you know, a newborn visit or even in our toddlers, like when your child is 18 years old, they're going to be transitioning over to our adult center. Um, we provide medication lists and I just check off exactly what we've done during that visit and it all gets recorded. So over time, we should be able to go back and see the progression of what interventions have been touched upon. So team members begin the discussion of transitions, like I said, very early. And ideally, we are striving to establish a lifelong transition. So even with those newborn periods going all the way through to end of life care and trying to help facilitate and be supportive in all of those areas. Right now, we've kind of designated to 14 and over, but we really tailor that based off of the patients and families because we are a smaller center, so we really know um, how they may respond, and so we tailor those discussions to them. Um, and really, again, fostering that relationship between our care team and the families. For our medication lists, we are trying to provide and empower our teenagers to know their medicines, to know the order of them, what they're doing, and how to acquire them. And so for patients 15 and over, we are compiling a medication list. So it will include their medication name, the dosage form, the dose and administration instructions, their dispensing pharmacy and contact information so they know who to call for refills or how to contact the uh, pharmacy, and then any additional information that they may need about that specific medication. So we can put albuterol before hypertonic saline um, or any other helpful tips that would be important. We typically will include their insurance information as well as any patient assistance funds that they have. And if there is a, a limit on the balance of those assistance funds, what their remaining limit is. We've developed a transitions of care survey for both patients and adults, our parents, um, and these really stem from a lot of the very helpful and useful resources that are already available. So there are lots of transition information available um, from the foundation, but one of the things that we've struggled with with our center is getting patients to remember their passwords and to log in outside of clinic to go and do these modules. And so we've transitioned some of that information into a survey where patients will assess their own knowledge and we'll see that tracked over time. And so we ask them if, they're, if they have questions, are they able to answer those or do they feel comfortable bringing up topics to their medical team? Do they know when to take their medications or how to renew them? And then if they're able to identify insurance issues, which is probably the biggest challenge, even for adults. So really preparing those skills. My favorite is the uh, question that if everything works out for you after finishing school or when you're 30, what do you see yourself doing? 
And so you can see some of the responses that we've received. So some of our patients want to go to veterinary school, nursing school, or work in the law department. We ask very similar questions for the parents. Um, they're just tailored from the other side of the coin. And so the parents are rating their children's knowledge and understanding and how confident they are for their child to go into the adult clinic. Um, and some of their responses are to have a family, go to college, maintain themselves independently, to be independent, happy, and healthy, um, and to live every moment. So that's probably my favorite question, even though um, it's just interesting to see what people want to do in the future. So as I mentioned, we try to facilitate independent visits. And with this, we really identify patients who are ready during our pre-visit huddle. So we go through and run key topics for each patient and we'll say that, you know, this patient at 10 o'clock is ready. We should ask their parents to step out of the room. And so we do the entire visit with the child and then bring the parent in towards the end and have the child explain back to the parent what had happened during that interaction. So we inadvertently use the teach back method and are there to support the child in any missing information or confusion. So one of our benefits is that we are a smaller center. So our care team does share a lot of uh, members. So for our pediatric and adult team, I am on both of those teams, our social worker, respiratory therapist, psychologist, our family partner, and our newest member, our dietitian, are on both of the teams. So our physician and our nursing um, staff are really the only ones that change. And so because we have a smaller intimate group, we're able to do sign-offs or handoffs um, between the adult and the pediatric clinic and provide a little bit more information rather than a patient going in and having no background and introducing themselves to a, a whole new group. So even though we've, we've made a lot of great strides, we have tried things that did not work. So one of the things that we initially tried was having a tracking device on a collaborative Teams page that to be honest, I forgot about and never filled out. So now I have a piece of paper that I carry with me in and out of clinic and everywhere I go and can't forget it. We tried to have our pharmacy technician join in on our hybrid in-person and telehealth visits. So we have um, some of our team members in on telehealth um, and that way our technician could provide updates to their medication lists and provide real-time changes. However, due to other responsibilities and conflicting um, challenges, they were not able to in, you know, engage in all of these visits. So, and then I, ideal timing for these care coordination or these handoff meetings because from the pediatric side, we were really excited that this patient is moving on. So after we saw them, we would try to do the handoff and then it would be three months before their next visit with the adult team and we would forget all of the information that was handed off. So now we're trying to tailor that to be about a week or two before their adult visit and so that information will be fresh. So where are we now? We implemented this a about a year ago, not quite. We have transitioned four of our patients from pediatric to adult clinic so far. We have two recent graduates who are slated for appointments in the adult clinic and anticipating one more by the end of this year. We have 16 patients that are 14 years or over, so should be transitioned by 2027. And we're expanding our transitions of care to younger and younger as we develop this um, program. So looking towards the future, we would like to try to get patients to have a readily accessible and easy, um, easily modifiable medication list, ideally on their phone or something that goes with them. So that's something that we're still trying to work on. Empower the teens uh, to sit down with their parents and call for refills and navigate these specialty pharmacies that you could be on the phone for, for 45 minutes to get one medication refill. Um, learning the lingo, because that's really hard. 
Um, and then eventually we assume responsibility for refilling medications, making sure that they're getting delivered, and whether that be through a patient portal or a mobile application, there are ways and strategies that we can make this easier. We're trying to engage our patient and family advisory committee to develop a celebration or some sort of recognition for children and families that you know, go to adult world and it's a big, it's a big change that should be celebrated. Um, and then also making sure that the parents who are transitioning have support because that's hard to let your child go from being in a pediatric center to an adult center where they're expected to be fully independent. And then, like I mentioned, expanding this into other disciplines and making it a lifelong transition. So in conclusion, our CF population is growing and medication management continually evolves, so it will continue to grow. And it's vital to empower our children and teens with the critical skills necessary to independently maintain their chronic disease. And so focusing on a formal transitions of care process that seamlessly integrates into clinical care is really important. And then expanding this into all aspects of care will be uh, vital for collaboration between patients, our providers, our healthcare team, and making it a um, success for everyone. So thank you all for your attention. I would like to acknowledge our care team and all of their support for this project. And I'm happy to answer any questions. So um, I have a, a question because I kind of struggle with this uh, in the transition process at my own center. Mm -hmm. But, uh, and if you covered this, I, I apologize. But do you have a, a way to uh, judge the effectiveness of your transition program, a follow up to the questionnaire to see um, how these patients are progressing towards our transition? Yeah, so ideally we're gonna use that survey over time and we're giving it younger and younger. And then we're not giving it at every visit because that would be, you'd get survey fatigue and burnout from that standpoint. So we're planning on doing several check-ins along the way. So if we're starting to give them at 12 years of age, then maybe check again at 15 and then again at 17 to see the progression. Um, since starting this, we've actually seen patients really engage and take ownership of learning their medicine. So some of the patients whose families always talked about, oh, they do their albuterol, then their hypertonic, and the, the child kind of sat there quietly, have really taken the initiative to speak up and own that. Um, and so that's been really enlightening to see. All right, one here from the app. Yeah. How do you transition patients to other facilities? That's a good question. It's, it's a little bit harder from the outside. Um, so what I have done is kind of make a similar medication list for patients that are leaving, and I will either send that to them through the patient portal or print it out for them to take to their, their next facility. Um, but that's, that's one of the challenges is getting to outside, outside facilities. I was, I'm curious if maybe, maybe you did mention this, but at what age do you start having the visit with the teenager or child alone without the parent? And then have you had met any resistance from the parents about the, this procedure? <laughs> <laughs> so we plan it. We don't have a hard and fast age where we start asking parents to wait in the lobby. We like... Like I said, we're a smaller center, so we have intimate relationships and in knowing how families are likely to respond. So we identify when they are ready um, and kind of take it patient case by case. And surprisingly, no. Parents are like, yep, see you later. I'll be in the lobby. So we really haven't had a lot of pushback. I've seen the opposite. I've seen really? the other full body up against the door trying to hear <laughs> hear what's going on in there. Maybe I'll have someone come check the doors from now on. <laughs> All right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Great job. All right. And our third speaker is um, Dr. Jacqueline Davis. And um, she is a pediatric pulmonologist um, in here, presenting here in her hometown from Boston Children's Hospital. And um, her talk will be on adult and teens with CF Embrace regular spirometry, 
use in a structured coach study protocol. And this is your third presentation this conference. So um, thank you so much for agreeing to um, speak again today. All right, thank you uh, for inviting me to speak. Thank you all for being here today. I'm excited to share some of the work we've been doing at Boston Children's on home spirometry uh, since the early years of the pandemic. I do receive grant funding from the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation. It's not hard for us to remember the impact that the pandemic had on our healthcare delivery system. Telehealth was rapidly adopted during the early years of the pandemic, and along with that, home spirometers were distributed widely thanks to the support of the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation. Remote patient monitoring, including home spirometry, had been studied relatively minimally pre-pandemic, with a notable exception of the E-ICE trial, finding that regular home spirometry led to earlier detection of pulmonary exacerbations, but did not change the decline in lung function over the study year. So pre-pandemic, most of us were not routinely using home spirometers. During the pandemic, with the shift towards telehealth and now the readily accessible devices, many centers started both using and also studying home spirometry in parallel. At Boston Children's, we developed a short-term feasibility protocol uh, that we implemented in 2020. This consisted of a one-time training session followed by two weeks of daily unsupervised spirometry with an option to continue using the device weekly for another eight weeks. We measured adherence to our study protocol, acceptability and repeatability of the data that we were receiving and conducted uh, interviews at the end of the study. We did this with two different devices, the Nuvo Air Air Next and the Zephyr X supported Mir Spirobank Smart, which was the device that was distributed by the CFF. So what did we find? On this short-term protocol, we had pretty high adherence, 80% to the daily spirometry, but this was over two weeks. Adherence rates declined over time. Um, with rates getting closer to the 60 to 70% range on the two-month extension. What did the data look like? When we discarded all of the data that was unacceptable, so those receiving grades of D, E, or F by ATS criteria, our adherence rates to the protocol dropped much lower in the 30 to 60% range. And this was true across both device groups. Other studies that have been looking at home spirometry find similar protocol adherence rates in the 60s to 70s percent range. How accurate are the data? If we're thinking about these home spirometry measurements, how do they compare to the conventional lung function measurements that we're all so used to and uh, comfortable with? Here I'm showing you a scatter plot of FEV1 of the two different devices with the red lines showing perfect concordance. We had to use a convenience sample, this was done in 2020, um, for our conventional measurement. So we picked a measurement within 90 days of starting the study to compare to the home device values. We found fair to good concordance in FEV1 between the home devices and in-clinic spirometry. But this Bland-Altman plot down below showed us that there was a bias toward lower values on both home devices relative to conventional measurement. And you can see by these dotted lines, um, the different colors corresponding to the different devices show a relatively wide limit of agreement. Other studies uh, have also found a bias for lower values on the home device, different home devices that have been tested relative to conventional spirometry. Some find that the home device certain home devices overestimate FEV1 compared to conventional spirometry. One study found that there was good concordance uh, between home and conventional spirometry, but did also show a wide limit of agreement. So all of this to say, um, while there is good correlation with the home device to conventional measurement, these devices may not be uh, giving us data that's interchangeable with our clinic measurements. I mentioned we did a survey um, to understand the patient experience of using these devices. Qualitatively, many people with CF participating in our study and others like using home spirometers. In our study, we found four key themes. Nearly all described ease of use and convenience, 
Importantly, many described negative experiences of either distrust of the results or technical difficulty. Some discussed a preference for home monitoring as compared to in-clinic testing, noting increased privacy and reduced pressure in the home setting. Something that was really interesting to me was that many made statements suggesting that greater access to their lung function data at home affected their thoughts or behaviors related to their CF care. Some were motivated by low numbers to exercise or perform their airway clearance, and others felt reassured by seeing their baseline numbers in the setting of acute symptoms. So with all this early work, we had a few key takeaways. Many people with CF are interested in using home spirometers. Some had distrust of the results, and they had good reason to do so. I don't need to tell any respiratory therapist the importance of effective training and coaching, and we felt like this was likely very important for effective home device use. And we wondered whether home spirometry may impact patient-reported outcomes, specifically patient engagement with their own care, and also as a sort of balancing measure, anxiety, with this increased testing burden and mental load of thinking about lung function more regularly, are we gonna drive any changes in patient-reported anxiety? So with that, we developed HS Pro. This is a longitudinal prospective cohort study that is still ongoing with a more rigorous training protocol with ongoing coaching over the study period. Our aims are to understand the impact of a structured training and coaching protocol on participants' ability to perform regular, acceptable, and accurate home spirometry tests. Our hypothesis being, with more structured training, we would have higher rates of acceptable data acquisition and more accurate measurement. We also seek to examine the impact of regular home spirometry use on patient-reported outcomes, with the thought that an increased access to lung function may promote engagement in one's overall care. And we seek to measure this with a survey called the PAM-13, or Patient Activation Measure. As I mentioned, this is an ongoing prospective cohort trial. We're enrolling teens and adults age 14 and greater. We completed our enrollment in June, which means we will complete data collection by the end of December. It's a six-month uh, study. The device we're using is the Nuvo Air Air Next, which is pictured here. And the protocol has two distinct phases, a training phase followed by a study phase, which I will show you in more detail in the next slide. Our outcomes, our adherence, rates of acceptable data acquisition, concordance to same-day uh, conventional testing, and then change in patient-reported outcomes. We're looking at health-related quality of life with the CFQR, measures of anxiety with the GAD7, transition readiness with the transition readiness assessment questionnaire, and then patient engagement with the patient activation measure. Here is our protocol. Training phase begins after enrollment with an initial training uh, visit. If a part once a participant completes training, they move along into study phase. If a participant does not pass training, they can reschedule for an additional training in about a week for up to five total training sessions. If a participant is unable to complete acceptable spirometry at the end of five training sessions, that completes the study for them. Once a participant enters study phase, we ask them to use their spirometer once weekly for six months. At the end of months one and three, we have dedicated uh, virtual check-ins that can include ongoing coaching if needed. Data is then reviewed monthly, and if there's a drop-off in protocol adherence or rates of technical acceptability, we can uh, schedule additional coaching as needed. For one routine CF care visit, we ask participants to bring in their home device, do their conventional spirometry as ordered by their physician, and then do an extra unsupervised session same day. To understand the impact on patient-reported outcomes, we are surveying our participants at three time points, study baseline, study midpoint, and study con completion. So what does our training session look like? It is a Zoom call with the study MD, that's me. I am not a respiratory therapist or a pulmonary function technician. I learned a lot during our pilot um, in working with our pulmonary function lab. During this training session, we unbox the device, download the app, pair the uh, device with the phone, and set up a profile. 
Then we do the spirometry. Participants must demonstrate that they can do two coach sessions achieving acceptable home spirometry data with uh, receiving grades of A, B, or C by ATS criteria, and the associated app does that grading. And then we reviewed the study protocol. Our virtual check-ins, which occur for everyone at the end of months one and three, are another Zoom call. We review home data for completeness and technique and do any retraining or technique adjustments if needed, and again, review the study protocol. So where are we now? We've enrolled 60 individuals into the study. Interestingly, 12 withdrew from the study after agreeing to participate before even completing the training. 48 completed at least one training session. One did not pass, 47 did, and of those 47, seven withdrew after completing the training before starting on study phase. 27 have so far completed the study and 14 continue as active. And we will finish all of our data collection by the end of this year. So who is in this cohort? Um, our demographics are shown here. Average age is 31, about 20% are teens, 50-50 uh, split male-female. Uh, our cohort is predominantly white and not Hispanic, although we do have representation of minority uh, groups here. We also sought to understand the baseline technology use of our uh, participants. Most use email, send or receive text messages, or access the internet at least once per week, and fewer look up health or medical information or receive text updates or alerts about health or medical issues at least once weekly. On to our feasibility data. Um, here I have plotted both the adherence and then rates of acceptable data acquisition by study month uh, along the x-axis. The dark blue lines are adherence, and, you can, and the dotted lines are the averages. We have overall high adherence to our study protocol. On average, it was 71. We started closer uh, to 80% at the beginning of the study, dropping down to 65 to 70% for the second half. This was much better than what we found in our pilot, which was also a much shorter uh, study. Similarly, our acceptability data uh, are quite good. So acceptability is shown in orange. This is a measure of all the tests that we received, how many received an ATS grade of A, B, or C, um, and our average rates are 88% of acceptable data. Um, and we did not see a significant technique decay over the study period. We attribute both of these trends to both the rigorous training session as well as requirements in order to enter into the study, as well as the ongoing coaching that we provided over the study period. This is some very preliminary um, analysis that we did for the purpose of this talk to look at the accuracy of the data that we've received. Now looking at a same day uncoached measurement compared to uh, conventional measurement under the typical circumstances. So here I'm showing you a scatter plot of FEV1. We have very high concordance with an R of 0.98. Uh, and our bland Altman plot here is showing that there's a very small average uh, difference of a lower uh, FEV1 of 75 mLs uh, on the home device compared to conventional clinic. But you'll still notice that there are a wide uh, range of agreement between 450, minus 450 to plus 250 mLs uh, difference. Similarly, for FBC, we have good concordance, uh, a little bit of a larger mean difference of minus 240 mLs on the home device compared to conventional spirometry and also wider limits of agreement. What about our patient reported outcomes? Um, I'm gonna show you a preliminary analysis of anxiety over the study period. Um, this is a spaghetti plot, plotting uh, our GAD7 scores at study baseline here, study midpoint, and study conclusion. Each line represents an individual participant, uh, and so you can follow levels of anxiety over time. The within subject effect size is very small and the P is non-significant, telling us that there was no significant change in anxiety over the study period, which was reassuring to us that we did not see a drive in increased anxiety with this added care burden. 
I will briefly mention the patient activation measure. Um, this is a validated survey tool with 13 statements uh, about self-management of care, very similar to some of the questions we see in the transition readiness questionnaires. Uh, include statements like, when all is said and done, I am the person responsible for managing my health condition. I am confident I can figure out solutions when new situations or problems arise. This survey tool is scored and participants are put into one of four activation levels with a lower number being less activated and a higher number being more activated. Um, and these different activation levels um, have been correlated with patient behaviors and also patient outcomes with those who are more activated having more positive health related behaviors and even better health outcomes, including um, BMI, blood pressure and cholesterol. It's been minimally studied uh, in the CF population. We didn't do an analysis of patient activation over time, but I just wanted to give you a sense of our baseline cohort. A little unsurprisingly, we have a very highly activated um, cohort. This is, you know, the CF uh, community is very uh, savvy. Uh, and then we're also looking at um, people who are opting into our study uh, and are kind of early adopters of something like home spirometry. But there are uh, at least a qu over a quarter who are not in the highest level. Um, so it will be interesting to see um, if we do detect any changes over time. In conclusion, uh, from this work, I would say post-pandemic home spirometry remains feasible. Most, but perhaps not all, can be readily trained to effectively use home spirometry devices. After a structured training and regular use, concordance to same-day conventional measurement is high, but the limits of agreement are wide. And this is going to affect how we think about home measurement um, and, and its inter interpretation. We have more to learn about the effect of regular home monitoring on patient reported outcomes, as well as clinical outcomes, healthcare utilization, and cost. Thank you to many, and I'd be happy to take any questions. I'm Shantae, I am work at a Pete Center um, in Salt Lake City, Utah, Primary Children's, and we had the lovely pleasure of doing home spirometry as well. Um, which was a huge undertaking. We have right around 220 to 250 age-appropriate PFT patients. And I think our biggest folly we ran into <clears throat> over and over was parents failing to re-measure their child. You know, we're six months in and they've clearly grown. And so <clears throat> we didn't have portal access initially. You know, drawing up the legal contract with our institution, I thought that was fun. Um, did you guys require any, like the Spear or Mirror Bank had its own specific washing, disinfecting, <clears throat> which is another, we felt like another layer of burden of care, which we definitely got negative feedback about. Um, you have a really gung-ho, small subset, like participating, which we had a handful of those too, but overall it's, our adult institution didn't support home spirometry. They didn't adopt it because their RTs don't, do the PFTs in clinic? Um, did you did you have any like is your is your PFT staff are they are they the RTs in your clinic or are they a different department? Yeah, so you have some great questions that are <laughs> a lot of which are about implementation, which is a whole nother can of worms, uh, for lack of a better term. Uh, than research where you know we have a lot of support and funding, protected time to do research, implementation, uh, kind of any, it's, it's a lot to manage. Um, in some of the implementation work, uh, I will say just to answer your question about kind of managing the device, we used a different device in this study than the Mirror Spirobank Smart um, that had a cardboard turbine that gets disposed. Um, but I have also worked with the, the Spiro Bank Smart, and yes, there are added um, burdens of, of making sure everything is clean. Um, when we have done implementation work, we uh, have had pulmonary function technicians who are part of our general clinic. There are one or two who are particularly interested um, in home spirometry. They have become uh, part of our dedicated kind of home spirometry team um, that consists of you know a couple of different roles and are instrumental in the device setup. But then also once patients leave the clinic, 
the you know the ongoing connection for re-coaching and reminders um, to use the devices, and then if needed, the real-time um, you know uh, audiovisual coaching that occurs. So it 100% is a team effort. It's impossible if it falls on one person's shoulders. One more last question. Uh, did you guys Um, th this is one of my biggest questions uh, that I was just looking for answers for at this conference. Um, we, this as part of research, we did zero billing. Um, and as part of our implementation, we also have received funding to, to do our implementation work. So we, again, did not submit for any reimbursement. I'm trying to build a program at our, um, at our, uh, in our division for CF, but both, of, and as well as other respiratory um, diseases. And the biggest reason, the biggest barrier is proof that we won't, you know, lose a lot of money. So um, hopefully there's more to come. <laughs> And, and there are billing codes for home spirometry, both for um, the technical charge for your mm -hmm. RT or personnel to do the test and for the physician to interpret, uh, but the, the reimbursement is like very bad, it's tiny. If anyone has practical experience with that, I would love to talk to you after. All right, Dr. Thomas. I was wondering, do, are you tracking um, patients whose home spirometry hits some like clinically relevant cutoff, like a 10% reduction from, you know, their in-clinic spirometry that if it were done at home might trigger some sort of treatment change? As part of the study, no. Um, we have, uh, because we're still trying to understand if these devices are reliable um, and accurate, it was kind of separated out. Thank you. All right, I have two great questions here on the app. Um, the first one is, did you notice any survey or questionnaire fatigue when asking patients to complete four questionnaires at once? 100%. I don't have the actual response rates to, uh, to share with you, but yes, we did not have 100% completion of the surveys. And then one more on here. Um, on, upon completion of this study, how do you plan to use home spirometry devices, and will this change the frequency of in-person visits? Ooh. That is such a great question. I think one that we're all trying to tackle. Um, I think at, now that everybody is more comfortable with telehealth, both on the clinician side as well as the patient and family side, I think we will be moving more towards telehealth and an important component of that will be home spirometry measurement. So I have a lot of ideas. I don't get to make all the decisions at my center, but um, yes, I do, I do plan to continue to use these devices um, in clinical care. All right, Hi. we'll have one more from Nat. Yeah, Natalie from uh, University of Missouri. Uh, thank you for your talk. Very, um, uh, got the little gray cells going. Um, but I would like to actually, uh, as you're discussing the whole concept of how do we keep this going, how did you choose your subjects? Um, are you looking at distance? Are you looking at, I mean, are these people in town? Are they out of town? How do you decide who to uh, discuss this with? Um, in, in clinical practice or for the research study? Both. So for the research study, we, you know, have lists of people who have expressed interest in research and we did not give any preference um, geographically or, um, or otherwise. We approached, we had a combination of both calling off of that list and then also approaching people who are coming in for their visits, but we had no real prioritization. Okay, so then clinically. So yeah, clinically on the implementation side, um, we have, uh, we're part of the iSpy, which if you came to the remote session yesterday, Dr. Theta Ong um, presented some work on. When we were selecting um, participants for the clinical implementation, we were trying to partner with people who, um, you know, we had good relationships with, we felt like would actually use the device, um, and that definitely biases our sample a little bit, um, but we were just trying to, in this, these early phases as we're testing feasibility and, and practicality, um, that's kind of where we landed. We're also in Boston where there, people are not driving the far distances and other parts of the country, um, others are. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, I'm, I'm particularly excited about, uh, about our next speaker because uh, she visited my center as part of the Mentor Apprentice Program. Um, and it was, it was super, um, I, was, I was very impressed because when she came to my center, 
I learned a lot from her, and I felt like uh, it's kind of like I would had been paired with another uh, experienced CFRT. So even though she was there to learn from me, um, we actually just clicked really well together. So it was it was a lot of fun having her. I'm really glad she's here speaking today. And uh, both the home spirometry and the pediatric to adult transition process. Uh, standardizing airway clearance are all uh, is very important things uh, to me and my center. So this has just been a, a wonderful session for me to moderate. So uh, my next speaker is Kim Valari. She's a registered respiratory therapist and a pulmonary function technician and the lead technician in the uh, PFT lab at Children's Hospital of Alabama. She's been there for 17 years and has been a dedicated CFRT for four years. Um, she's been very active at conference, both writing abstracts and presenting posters. Um, last year, had, uh, she had a session about seeing more than just CF in our complex uh, uh, care model that we have CF. Um, and uh, her passion is making uh, chest PT and airway clearance accessible to all of her patients, and she really loves to encourage her patients to uh, take an active role in their uh, own health care. So join me in welcoming Kim. Thank you for that introduction. <laughs> All right. I have nothing to disclose. So this isn't the first time this project um, has been done in our clinic. There was a project done in 2011 and 2012 where they um, identified knowledge deficits involving medications and the order of therapies. Remediation was done and was successful. And then in 2023, I was selected for the Respiratory Mentor Apprentice Program, went to Riley's <laughs> Children's Hospital in Indianapolis, Indiana, and Andy was my mentor. Like we both said, it was a really great experience, and I hope everybody really looks into this program and takes advantage of it. Um, I didn't know what kind of project I wanted to do, so uh, I shamelessly took his questions. <laughs> <laughs> to evaluate the respiratory self-management within the constraints of age and development appropriateness with a successful remediation at the next clinic. Our goal was to have start at age three and up for them to be actively participant in their respiratory care and promoting their patient involvement and their self-management. Uh, this is the process map. So as you can see, um, they started at three then yes, then we ask them some questions, and then if they were follow, if they were going with this, then we uh, uh, gave them affirmation and told them they were doing a great job and to continue. And if not, then we worked with the family on their what they were not doing correctly for, and asked them again on their next visit. I used three to five questions um, by the age category of three to five, six to eight, nine to twelve. 13 to 15, 16 to 18. These questions were cross-referenced with CF RISE. I tracked the results in an Excel spreadsheet and made a note to remind myself when they came back to the next visit in EPIC. So the next few slides will be the goals for each age group and their patient family feedback. So ages three to five, begin to put on their, the vest, begin involvement of preparing the medication, squirting the medicine into the saline or, or saline into the nebulizer cup and using a spacer with the correct technique. Some of the feedback, she has trouble getting dressed and you expect her to know this? <laughs> yes, I do. He's very independent and wants to do everything himself. And I would love to teach my child and take some burden off of me, which we've all heard before. When I was putting this slot, this session to, or PowerPoint together, I came across uh, the picture here, and it's actually of, from one of our parent perspectives that was on the CF um, community blog titled Raising an Adult in Training, and there's some good points that I wanna mention on here before we move on. Rethink your expectations. Children are capable of way more than we give them credit for. They organically absorb more information then we notice. They watch us as we wash our hands before handling nebulizers, how we piece the clips together, connect the tubes to the vest, dispense the order of medic medications. So when given a chance, they want to, and often can, correctly replicate our actions by themselves. 
provide the opportunity to succeed. We've all heard it, whether if we have children ourselves or the kids that we see in clinic, let me do it. That is, there are basically ways to let your opportunity to let your child tag in with the steps of the treatment. Because each step builds on top of the other, laying a strong foundation of confidence in the child. And lastly, it is our job to strategically, excuse me, aim our cystic fibrosis fighters with a toolbox of compliance and education, walk the line of educating them, but not overwhelming them, but giving them the moments of independence and not dumping it on them all at once. So continuing with that, ages six to eight, become more responsible for initiating treatments, put on and set up the vest, learn the names of medication and help clean with supervision. All right, this is where I want everybody to get involved. So one of the uh, answers, a patient, I said, what are your medications? She said, ASP. We all know, what does ASP stand for? <laughs> exactly, it was, I said, what does that mean? And she said it. This one's a little different, circle, square and cold. There you go. The top of the albuterol is a circle. Yeah. I don't know how they came up with the square for the hypersal, but <laughs> we all know. Is it a really a square? Okay. A square. Uh. And then the pulmazine is cold. So he knew, go get your cold medicine. Not allowed in the kitchen. And I had kids that were just not interested in learning. <laughs> Nine to 12 more responsible for initiating, initiating treatments according to the plan, set up and put away equipment, know the name of medications and your vest settings, prepare equipment with minimal support, and understand how to clean equipment correctly with supervision. All right, college football is big in Alabama. I, where are my Alabama people? There you go, thank you. <laughs> we actually had a family, so this, the mascot, this is Big Al from the University of Alabama, and this family used Big Al to help the child remember albuterol. <laughs> I know, it's brilliant. Okay, the next one is I had a patient and his grandfather came in wearing Al Bundy's jersey. Do you all remember the TV show Married with Children? <laughs> wearing this, they love the show, and this, patient was not interested in learning. So I, I met him in what he enjoyed. And I was like, just what your first medication starts, Al, and I tried to prompt him and it was like, Al Bundy? And I was like, no, it's albuterol. But the next time we saw him three months later, he remembered albuterol, Al Bundy. It was a win, I'll take it. <laughs> We already have kids that are bringing the nebulizer and the vest. They've moved them to their room. And then some kids knew their medication with prompting and they knew with cleaning and disinfecting the prompting. Uh, 13 to 15, responsible again for initiating treatment with supervision, initiate the treatment according to the plan, prepare and clean the equipment accordingly. This is also the age that I found where um, our patients are starting their solo visits. So during pre-visit planning, we're like, okay, this one's getting ready to go to a solo visit. We'll give them a brochure about it so they can prepare for the next visit will be solo. And this is also the age, I do a lot of the rest of the pulmonary function testing. This is the time where they're like, what do these numbers mean? What did this number mean? What does that number mean? So it was good conversation to have with them. The feedback on this was I will start teaching him how to clean and disinfect equipment. I only do treatments when I'm sick, which we are already hearing a lot of. It's time for her to learn, and I clean only with hot water. And lastly, 16 to 18, initiate all treatments without supervision, full knowledge of all aspects of the treatment plan, prepare and clean equipment with no supervision. And the feedback, I only do treatments when I'm sick, and we've heard this a lot due to the highly effective modulator therapy, but then we can kind of shift the question is, okay, when, what, makes, what is it about you when you're sick that you feel like you need to start your treatments? Or I'm kind of taking this from the, um, the debate with the 
physical therapy and the airway clearance, she, one of the uh, physical therapists said, check in with your chest, which I thought was a really good thing to remember to ask our patients. Have you checked in with your chest? Have you huff coughed recently to see how they're feeling? Feedback on this one, again, I don't need a spacer anymore, so we always try and encourage using the spacer and why. Some were cleaning with vinegar, some were cleaning with salt, they only boil. And the last one, wait, what? I'm supposed to clean and disinfect? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I started the project on January of this year, finished um, for the the sake of the poster and all of that at the end of June, but we're still continuing to do this. 82% of our patients at the center between the ages of three and 18 had an initial self-management evaluation. 17% of those had an initial evaluation with a remediation encounter, and 80% showed they remediated, uh, showed improvement. Here are the results between each age group. Three to five, two remediated, two improved, that's a win. Six to eight, two remediated, two improved. Nine to 12, 12 remediated and eight improved. 13 to 15, 10 remediated, nine showed improvement. 16 to 18, four remediated, three approved. And between the age range of uh, three to 18, we have 210 patients. I saw 172 during this time with the totals of 30 that remediated and 24 that showed improvement. I would like to thank my Children's of Alabama and UABCF team, and also to Stephanie Gamble and Virginia Viner for their help with my project. And lastly, it's not what you do for your children, but what you've taught them to do for themselves that will make them successful human beings. That's it. Oh, great. All right, we have at least one question right now on the app. Um, what does remediation entail? Um, especially for cleaning and disinfecting, that was one of the big trends that we saw was we actually have uh, just a piece of paper, you know, to remind them how to clean and disinfect and what the CF, uh, the foundation wants us to do. And then with the edge of, with the um, medications, it was more of like, you know, we live in Alabama, Albuterol, Alabama, just kind of working with them on the names of their medicines. I have just one thought. Like, you saw almost 180 patients in six months. So yeah. I really think that that is, like, an enormous effort. So I just, like, applaud you for being able to complete that because that is, that that's a lot. It, it ended up being kind of easy because you know, as I'm like ending their information in the computer, I'm like, hey, I'm working on this project. Will you answer some questions? You know, and then like the other speaker said, you'd hear, I would ask the patient and you'd hear mom off to the side. And I was like, uh -uh. I just want to hear their perspective of it. And if the kid was like, I don't know. And I said, well, ask your parent how you clean and disinfect to just kind of open up that conversation going. I would just like to comment and say that, that that's just awesome work, Kim. And, and if you are an RT, um, or a caregiver in a pediatric center, I think it's it's our duty to be sure that we're sending patients to adult centers that are are at least um, you know mostly capable of taking care of themselves. And if you're a RT or a clinician in an adult center and your pediatric RTs are not sending you prepared patients, then you need to pick up the phone and say we need to work on this because you know. We're making your job harder if we're not getting these patients ready for a transition. So excellent work, Kim. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, and last but certainly not um, least, I have the pleasure of introducing Annie Sue, um, who is the nurse practitioner and program coordinator from UCSF Adult CF Center. And she was gracious to kind of continue on the with the work of her original colleague and, and still present um, this um, quality improvement project to you all. So um, with that, please welcome Annie. Thank you so much, everyone, um, for allowing us to um, share this uh, QI project that our 
Care Center has been working on over the last year. There are no relevant disclosures that I have um, relevant to this um, presentation. So as we all know, um, the respiratory therapist, or RT for short, is um, a core member of the CF care team um, and is instrumental in providing education and support around airway clearance techniques and inhaled therapies um, and maintenance and troubleshooting of respiratory care equipment and supplies. In 2020, we had an institutional change at UCSF to the ambulatory um, RT workflow. So um, what happened was that um, previously um, the RT visits and evaluations were embedded within CF care visits, but after 2020, um, they became a uh, referral based only. Um, so what that meant was that providers would refer patients at the time of the clinic visit to see the RT, but that visit would happen um, at a future separate date. So we wanted to understand what impact this had on the annual number of RT visits for our center. We first looked to our annual um, CF Care Center reports between 2017 and 2023. Um, so in this graph, the blue line represents um, the national value of all CF patients. Um, purple line is the median percentage of RT visits for all adult programs. And then the green line is our adult CF Care Center. Um, so as you can see, we had been falling um, within range of the median and the national values um, prior to 2020. And then after the process change in 2020, um, the numbers fell significantly from you know, 95, 98% down to below 50%. And that um, drop was sustained. So we asked ourselves, um, was this drop truly because of this process change? Um, we used the A3 um, framework to guide us in identifying the problem. Um, first, we documented um, all the current conditions. So we limited um, our data set to the 92 patients out of 150 patients that we care for in our center who did not have an RT visit in the year of 2023. Um, and then we made a process map of the current workflow by interviewing all of the individuals involved. Um, so it goes something like this. So at the time of the clinic visit, the provider enters a referral um, to CRRT um, that falls into a work queue in the electronic medical record system um, that signals to our clinic staff to request insurance authorization for that visit. Um, that can happen anywhere from immediately the same day up to like about a week. Um, when that happens, um, or when it's ready to get scheduled, um, our clinic staff then calls the patient by telephone. They give the patient up to three tries to answer and to get something scheduled on the books. Um, or if clinic staff see that um, the patient is signed up for the patient portal through the EMR, then they will send the patient um, a self-scheduled ticket. And if all those things um, work and happen, um, then there's a reminder message three to five days prior to the visit via um, a text message or a message to the patient portal um, reminding them. And then finally the patient is, um, sees the RT over video. Um, in person is also um, an option, but most of these visits happen over video. Um, this process is really not unlike you know, what it takes to schedule a CF care visit, but I think it's really helpful to sort of see all these touch points and how many things have to be successful in order for somebody to actually see our RT. So then we performed um, a root cause analysis. Um, we pulled, um, we looked at all of the um, patient charts for these 92 patients that um, did not have an RT visit in 2023. Um, and we looked and see, saw, like, tried to sort of list all the reasons why they didn't have a visit and then tried to group them in um, according to themes. Like, was this because um, staff weren't trained? Is it because there was some technical issue with the EMR? Um, you know, what was going on? So what we found was that of these 92 patients, 32 were just flat out not referred. Um, 23 of these patients were referred and yet still had no RT visit. Uh, 21 patients were transplanted patients, so um, very likely the provider just didn't think that um, referring them to RT was um, relevant. 
um, nine patients transferred centers, and seven of these patients, they were seen by our respiratory therapist, but um, the visit was actually not entered into the registry. So we really focused on these 23 folks um, circled in red who were referred, but um, never actually had an RT visit. Um, and then as you can see on the chart on the right side, all the potential reasons that didn't happen, um, which ranged from the referrals were just entered incorrectly, patients no-showed, patients canceled, staff weren't able to contact the patient, or um, you know there was just miscommunication amongst clinic staff as to who um, was responsible for actually scheduling the patient. So, you know, 54 of these 92 patients who didn't have an RT visit, they were impacted by this institutional change. Um, of the 54 patients, 29 had at least one exacerbation in the following year, which did require treatment. Um, 18 of these folks um, had reduced frequency of airway clearance techniques and 20 had stopped airway clearance techniques altogether since being on highly effective modulator therapy. Um, and I thought it was really interesting to see that four of these patients had pretty severe exacerbations leading to hospitalization. Um, one individual had a significant drop in her lung function and so she was admitted for IV antibiotics. Another patient failed outpatient oral antibiotics um, and was admitted also for IV antibiotics. Um, and I thought it was interesting that when he was inpatient, um, he commented, this is the worst I've ever felt um, since being on Trikafta, and he actually forgot that he had CF. Um, another patient had massive hemoptysis and hypoxic respiratory failure um, and underwent a bronchial artery embolization. And then um, a fourth patient presented to our ER um, complaining of dyspnea and chest congestion, um, and in the ER actually um, coded, uh, was intubated, um, has since recovered, but um, I think, and very likely he had um, a lot of other significant comorbidities that contributed to this. Um, but I think the takeaway here is that um, a lot of these folks were really quite unprepared to restart airway clearance therapies um, and access inhaled therapies at the time of illness. We first wanted to look at the most common reasons um, um, that no RT visit happened in 2023. So the first one was that providers were just not placing the referrals. So we did a very simple intervention. We um, identified all the patients during preclinic huddles um, um, who needed RT referrals and then um, made sure at the time of the clinic visit that these referrals were being input. Um, and then the second um, largest reason was because there was confusion amongst different staff members of who was responsible for scheduling the visit um, once the referral was placed. So we streamlined this um, and selected um, certain personnel to be accountable for, these, for this role. So the chart below um, is kind of demonstrating the progress to date with these two interventions. Um, the blue bars um, are the number of RT visits in 2023, and then the orange bars are the RT visits um, in 2024. Um, so we started these interventions in March. Um, and then you can see since March, over the last six months, you know, some months are better than others. Um, I don't think we're seeing the, um, the expected outcomes of improvement that we had hoped, but I think by the end of the year, there will be um, an overall net improvement. So um, I think in, Looking at this um, more closely, we realized, you know, RT visits and airway clearance um, technique, um, they still have a really crucial role for patients despite highly effective modulator therapies. Um, it's making the RT visit separate from the clinic visit led to a significant reduction in RT care. Um, we found that a large proportion of folks have reduced or stopped airway clearance therapies in light of highly effective modulator therapies. And the reduction in RT care has resulted in a lot of missed opportunities for ongoing education and support for urgent issues, um, potentially um, causing unnecessary hospitalizations um, and represents an unequal access to um, accepted standards of CF care. Um, so going forward, I think it'll be important for us to evaluate the interventions that we're implementing, whether we deem them successful or not. Um, and I think we have a lot 
um, to understand about why patients are not following through with the RT visits, what those barriers are, which ones are modifiable. Um, a lot of, we assume some of these include, you know, they're feeling well on highly effective modulator therapies, they've got appointment fatigue, there are additional co-pays to these visits, and um, they have to take time off from work, school, or childcare. Um, and lastly, as we've seen many folks um, stabilize on highly effective modulator therapies, we have um, to really move, or our, our team is really working on moving towards an emphasis on RT visits as an opportunity to really prepare our patients in um, the case of urgent situations. Those are my acknowledgments. Um, happy to answer any questions. I think the, that your last statement, uh, just having an emphasis on being prepared for those exacerbations is, uh, is, is really crucial because when we do see a lot of that um, reduced therapy uh, with patients on modulators, um, I do get a sense that sometimes that they're, they are not going to be prepared to take care of themselves when and if they do get sick. So I think uh, an emphasis on at least being prepared and having that knowledge is, is pretty vital. I have a flurry of um, at questions here. So I'm going to start with probably the big elephant in the room. Do you know why the clinic practice was changed to separate the embedded RT initially? I have, Jeff is our respiratory therapist, and I want him to, he's been doing this longer than I have. I want him to, Jeff, do you feel comfortable sure. um, explaining? I think it all started when somebody found out that we can charge for each visit. So I think it had to do with money, oh. it, truly. And so, because I used to piggyback onto the provider. So I would see all the patients in clinic. And then it got to be where now you need the referral. And, who, and then it has to go back to with the modulators. I feel good, the patient. I don't need to, why, and then the money, why would I pay Jeff, why do I have to pay $30 to see Jeff? I know what I'm doing. I hope that answers the question. Yes, yeah. Okay, yeah. We're, thanks. Oh, we're I, not that's allowed a, to charge. Yeah, we're not either. Yeah. Because, mm -hmm. you, you know, I had, you have to talk to the coder, the biller, I have to, you know, the, the whole, everything's different. And then I don't even think, that's another thing, we found that since we went to this referral and we're billing, they're not getting reimbursed. So why can't I go back to piggyback? Right. I'm Alyssa Perez. I'm uh, one of the CF pulmonologists in UCSF. Amazing job, Annie. I just wanted to add, I think that Jeff, the, the hope was to bill for your services for things like contaminating inhalation and do sputum, but that's not clearly the main factor of our patients. And I think right. there's a loss of really the true purpose of having an RT and CF clinic and why that's so important. Um, so this is, we're hoping to use uh, Annie's amazing work to advocate with our upcoming site visit to try to change this. Did you have a poster? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> So I think we probably already no. answered that, but, um, oh, was someone else? Oh, what? Oh gosh, um, <laughs> seven, 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 eight. Thanks, Bella. <laughs> so one of the questions is, is Jeff your only RT or would patients um, with the, the, be having the RT referral get seen or referred to a different RT each referral? Jeff is our, is our man. Okay. There's only one, yeah. I retired. Yeah, back. yeah. <laughs> just because of this, yeah. I think we've docu they've documented why you're needed. Go ahead. I just had a question about the PFT. If the patient wasn't being seen by the RT at every visit, how often did they get PFTs and who did them? So we try to get at least, it's hard, but at least one every year. Wow. Um, wow. And anytime somebody's coming in in person, we always make sure that um, a spirometry is scheduled the same, at the clinic visit. Our institution, the RT for adults, don't do the PFTs. There's a PFT tech that, that does the PFTs. Yeah, correct. 
I think I think my patients would love that setup because they get tired of seeing me do, I do the spirometry and then see them in their room after a while. It's like, I've had enough of Andy, he can go away. So. All right, Annie, so do you plan to submit this data to your institution and would they maybe make changes to better utilize your RT now that you have the data? It's a good question. We've, um, this is not a new problem. This has preceded me by many years, <laughs> um, but we continue to try to advocate um, to leadership that this is really important, and this is a this is a core member of our CF care team, as was confirmed in the updated um, care models that we learned about. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much for Thank you. presenting that. Thank you. I don't think any of my colleagues back in Indianapolis are going to believe that I have finished talking about anything early, but we are done a little bit early today. Uh, if there's any additional questions, you can please come up. Uh, they, they can be answered at a later date in the app. And uh, thank you all for coming. Thank you.